I'll do. You'll have to excuse the darkness, it's really bright and I'm losing my voice. Which some people might think is not a bad thing. So yesterday I did an interview, you'll be watching that tonight. I just want to thank everyone really as a community, how you support people that, you know, I have chats with. Uh, this lad, Nick, weren't easy when I met him. We literally, I've rocked up. We've had a coffee we've never met before. And he has spoke about things he's never spoken about in his life. He's an ex-squaddy, man's man, always in the gym. You know, bottled things up for 30 plus years that have affected him. So um, I just want to thank everyone, how they support people. Um, everyone who support the channel. And yeah, it, it was tough for this lad and it's tough for a lot of people that I have on the channel. So I appreciate everything and uh, I really appreciate how supportive as a community you are. So thanks for that. Cheers. I'll say that. How do? How do, Sam? Um, I'm not going to introduce this lad. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself. What I will tell you... Uh, which is fairly amazing to me. He's a scouser, uh, and you definitely haven't got a scouse accent, have you? No, I'm a, I'm a posh scouser. Posh scouser. So Nick is an ex squad I've wanted to speak to someone a long time. Uh, we've had a brief exchange of emails, a brief coffee and chat, and um, why are we here first, Nick? Why you know why have you why why, why have we met up? What do you want to talk about? Well, after watching your channel <clears throat> and seeing your content and seeing that you, you're interested in people's backstories and that you actually, you know, show empathy and understanding. And for someone like me who, who kept problems hidden for so many years in denial, I thought it was about time, you know, just to uh, put it out there. Just to, just, to, just to speak about it because I'm not the only one who's going through it. There's other plenty of veterans out there who've been through the same shit. You know, a lot worse. The thing, the thing is, one of the things we've just said, uh, you're fed up of being judged. Never judge a book, right? The guy's jacked. Goes to the gym every day at six o'clock. Yeah, uh, he's an ex-squad. Eh? Yeah. Um, he just made me laugh as we went for his coffee because he were marching across the car park trying to get in line with me. Instead, um, he has got his own traits, his own tics, whatever you call them. But yeah, um, we all say never judge a book, but people do. Um, they do. They do. Yeah. So you can start, Nick, whenever you want, mate. Uh, you know why you went into army? What was it? Careers advice or just? Well, it was. Um... It was just on a whim, really, more than anything. It was, um, I joined up very quickly. I left school. I did, I did very well at school. I, I, I mean, I slipped under the radar. People thought I was very academic, but what, what I was, what I had this gift, I could read and remember. So I did very well at school. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't any smarter than anyone else, but I just had this gift to, I could sit down and read for hours and remember stuff. And uh, so I did really well at school. And, <clears throat> passing the Army Careers Office one day when I just left school, 16. I just popped in <clears throat> and uh, asked them about technician trades and they gave me this leaflet and it was about technician trades the, in the Royal, Remy, Royal Signals, Royal Engineers. They, they, they all had apprentice colleges at that point. And uh, so I said, oh yeah, I'm interested. I like the look of the Remy. And um, <clears throat> within literally a week, I'd done all the tests, so I met the scores to be a tech, to train as a, an apprentice tech. I'd had me medical the next day. A couple of days later, I was at the Junior Army Selection Centre and I was offered a place, so it was that quick. At 16, you, you, you know, so, so young I, it was that kind age. of bang, and I was, uh, you know, I had a place. In Did you discuss it with parents or anything, or was it just like, this is what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do? I remember my mum saying to me, I mean, they didn't object to signing because I was, because they had to sign because I was, yep. you know, 16. I remember she said to me, she said, are you sure you want to do this? She said, well, why don't you go, you know, what about A-levels, university? And I was like, you know, like every 16 year old, I knew everything. Yeah. I know best, you know, so I, so I went ahead with it and I, uh, you know, joined the army. To, 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 to make that part of it brief, 
<clears throat> when I was um, 18, I signed on for nine years. Are um, you a full soldier at 18? Is it like an apprenticeship for two years or are you a full soldier at 16? Can they send you off? When when can you go and fight? Well, I think, I think it was um, 17 and a half or 18. But as a when we when I joined it, we, we were classed as boy soldiers. Right. Okay. And you didn't sign on until you were eighteen. Right. Okay. So, um, but I think seventeen and a half, eighteen, you couldn't do anything. You know, you couldn't uh, couldn't be sent anywhere. But I was I was in I was in the apprentice college, and I was there for over two years. Um, it's gone now. It's uh, it's a housing estate now. But uh, and then I went on to do me trade training. I was a telecommunications technician. Basically, I repaired radios. Loved the job because it was—it's uh, something I've always enjoyed being a diagnostic engineer. Um, long story short, I only did one operational tour. Uh, I was in the first Gulf War um, with FRG Seven Forward Repair Group, Seventh Army Brigade. <clears throat> so I was—you know—we were forward echelon. We were so we drove through all the shit that um, you know. As I said to you earlier, I'm not. Uh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't infantry. I wasn't in the powers or anything. <clears throat> anyway, we came back from that. Ninety-one, um, April ninety-one, something like that. And later that year, I signed off because I had to give twelve months' notice. So was that your eighth year then? About yeah, yeah, just past my eight-year point at that point, and um, so I signed off, handed me notice in. And uh, how it started was in the last, I think it was in the last six months, I just started getting these panic attacks, which were just out of the blue. I mean, completely overwhelming, blinding panic attack from from nowhere. Can you remember the first one? I remember it vividly. I was uh, I was sitting on my wagon in, on my electronic, all my, basically, we were, we were because we were mobile, we had a box body on the back of a flatbed. Yep. Bedford. Yep. Dragging a generator. So all my test equipment was in the in the uh, box body. And I was in there on my own, just working my radio or something one day, and I was just completely overwhelmed with this um, sense of anxiety and fear, and my heart was started beating. I thought it was going to explode. Couldn't breathe, you know. Ended up with me head between my legs, trying to get control of my breathing. You're quite a fit lad then. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I was big into running when I was in the army. I was, yeah. uh, I was about four stone lighter than I am. Did now. you know what was happening? Didn't have a fucking clue. Didn't have a clue what was going on. And like, and um, of course the <clears throat> other veterans from, and I've heard similar stories from veterans from more recent times. Going reporting sick was discouraged for anything. In the army, I can't I can't talk for the navy or the RAF, but it was discouraged. They used to call them the sick, lame, and lazy, and you d you just didn't do it. <coughs> and and there was no mention of mental health. You didn't. That was a no no. You didn't. Even though my career was basically finished, and I was it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't. Did you go to the medic then? No. Oh, did I did I fuck? I didn't tell anyone. I just kept it quiet. Oh. I just modelled on. You know. Did it happen a lot in that last six months? I'd say it happened uh, maybe three times in, in in that in that period. But I just got you know I just got on. I just tried to keep it quiet. Tried to not let anyone know about it. And uh, anyway, I left. I was a single guy, so I ended up back at my parents for eighteen months. I I came out into the recession of the early nineties. It was fuck all work. I, I remember attending quite a lot of interviews. Get, I was getting to the interview stage, but, yep. but wherever, whenever I got an interview, there was always someone better qualified because the pieces of paper the army gave us weren't worth shit. Well, you don't you know, get good references or anything well, like well, they, well, they weren't civilian qualifications. Right, okay. Well, they weren't very good civilian qualifications. So for the amount of experience you had, you, you were... You know, you were. I, that was the first thing I realised when I got out was that I was so far behind my peer group. You know, which is strange. That isn't education. It? You go in, you do, you do a skill. You've yeah. got a skill, a career, and it's not worth a toss when you come out. No, I mean, I, I eventually 
down the line, spent six years doing an open university degree. And in the last five years, I've done, I don't know, 25 IT courses to stay current and keep myself, you yeah. know, you know, um, but yeah, back then, you, you, I was so far behind my peer group. It was frightening. And so that's, you know, kind of, kind of how I fell into working in the How, off, how did you struggle industry. adjusting? Because look, it, it's very cliched, isn't it? I've met enough lads, right. they don't sell. You know, find it difficult. Well, I never did. I mean, um, in the 18 months I was at my parents, like I said, I didn't, get, I didn't find a job for six months. And in those six months, the uh, panic attacks carried on and it got worse and worse. It got to the point where I didn't want to walk out the front door. Uh, but again, you know, that army attitude, I never told anyone, I never told my parents, I never went to the doctors. Well, it's not only army, that makes men. Yeah, that's that's very true. You, can that's I just, true. I, 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 I don't want to interrupt you. I'm, I'm just going to say something now, guys, uh, that I think is, is quite relevant. So Nick, very kindly, is speaking about this today. He does feel very strongly about it. I will tell you quite now, he is a little bit younger than me, but he's lived with his shit all his life. And Significantly younger than you. You're three years younger. Yeah, there you go. Three years younger. <laughs> all right. Fucking significantly. <laughs> Fucking scousers. <laughs> no, on a serious note, right, he's carried a lot of this uh, with him all his life. Yeah. It is only in recent times he started dealing with this. I can tell now, you know, you, you can feel a little bit tense or whatever. Um, it's obviously very fresh. And... I will tell you quite definitely now, mate, there will people who watch this who relate to you, and even though you might not believe it, it will definitely help them. So I didn't want to stop you mid-flow, but I can see, you know, so away you go. The panic's continued, so you, you didn't tell your parents. Didn't, didn't tell No anyone, GP, no, no nothing. No GP, nothing, nothing. And, uh, you know, I just got on with life, bought a house, Got married, got divorced, all the usual shit that goes on. Was it a long marriage? We don't have to talk about it in six, depth. Six years. It wasn't, yeah, six years. Um, Was it what you were expected to do then? Did Did you think that you should come out of the army, settle down, have kids? Is that sort of a... Or was it just just the way things went? Um, I think it was just the way, the way things went, <clears throat> you know? Um, because I was still... I was actually quite happy living on my own because... Because I never did truly settle, you know, I mean, I've, I've spoken to other people about this and, and I, I said to someone, it took me, I reckon it took me six or seven years after leaving before I actually felt like a civilian. You know, the first two, time that. The, the first two years, I just felt like I was on leave. Listen, I, you know, knocked about with uh, in my first job and lived with uh, an ex-para. And uh, he was an absolutely lovely lad. He was fucking crazy when he was drunk. And his life was chaotic. Absolutely mm. chaotic. Relationship-wise, it was chaotic. Mm. You know, we had moments of clarity when we lived together and that. He got an art of gold, but he was, he just, everything he did were crazy, do you know what I mean? It was just, yeah, they were nothing. Yeah. You, you could see it. Yeah, so I ended up, uh... Working in the offshore industry as a contractor mainly. Um, On rigs? Rig ships um, all over the world. <clears throat> um, a lot of work in shipyards and the like, but a lot of offshore stuff. Um, what, what sort of stuff were you doing then? You well, I work in... Technical um, stuff, or were you? Oh, yeah, technical stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I basically work in... At the, uh, at the moment now, I'm working in... Um, it's subsea positioning and subsea communications so it's uh, yeah it's a very technical job and uh, what i do at the moment is I, you know i install and integrate systems on vessels in and rigs so there's um it's traveling here there and everywhere and uh i think uh, yeah that was part of the not settling down it was we still not sell then are you if no i never have i never have as far as I never have because I'm still dealing with this um, because I've never found, I've never found a solution, you know, or I've never been smart enough to. I, I mean, one of the problems for me was that I was in constant denial of it, and like I said to you earlier, I didn't think I deserved it because I didn't. I because I came back in one piece. I didn't have my legs blown off. I wasn't in the infantry. I wasn't in the paras. I only did one operational tour. 
So I never felt like I was worth. I, th I think it is uh, worth it. You know, lasses I mean? do do it, but lads you know. in particular do it. You look at someone else who's worse off with you, and then you think, you, you know, yeah, they're the ones I, who I, have, I, I, they I'm deserve right. the help. Yeah. You know, you know, you you don't. Yeah, and so uh, <clears throat> I think that's why it took me so long to. Well, that's half the problem, isn't it? Because you don't like let yourself heal. I mean, we can't use words like heal when you talk about men and things like that, can we? No, no, no. We've got to be uh, macho and all that, you know. And so, you know, life is, you know, like everybody, I, um, like a lot of veterans, at one point, I fell into, uh, fell into a bottle around sort of 2006 to 2008 and, uh, um, very regimented, as I mentioned to you earlier. Ex explain that. Very reg. I was very regimented. I had me. I had this um, between six and ten. Never drank during that, the day. Is that a night? Yeah. Six bit until ten. Six till ten. Is when was, you drank. That's when I drank. And how much did you drink? Uh, I was up to four bottles of wine a day. Every day, seven days a week. And did, did you hold the job down and the family life while still? Yep. Um, Completely functioning alcoholic. I was. I ate well. I looked like this. I trained. I was in the gym, so that hid it. Because people don't expect someone who looks fit and healthy to be an alcoholic. F for me, uh, you know. So I hid it very well. Do, do you not think that's burning the? So you look fit. However, it is burning the candle at both ends, isn't it? Oh you're yeah. Knocking, I mean, you're yeah. knocking your body drinking that much, but then also you're training. Yeah. You it, know. Gave, it gave it. In its way, I mean, like any addiction, it, it gave me, a, a, um, mom, you know, relief for that period of time. Why? Because it hid your emotions? Yeah, because it just made me forget shit. It made me forget. It made me stop worrying about um, what was going on, you know, uh, the mental health issues, what other people thought of me and other people's opinions and being misunderstood. How important was that, shit. what people thought about you? Um, well, I, try, I always tried to tell myself I didn't give a shit. I always used to say, I don't care if you like me, judge me on the job that I do. But it is hurtful, you know, and you do pick up on it very quickly when people... I mean, I'm sure you, I'm, you're a big lad. You've, I, bet, I bet people have looked at you and, and made a decision without even fucking talking to you. No fucking shit. I, there you go. So, you know, that, that, that's right, right, you know, you just that's said that, I, a big lad. I am not the biggest lad, right? Yeah, I'm six foot. I, I have got a bit of timber on me. But as a young lad, when I was 20, 21, 22, literally walk into a pub, walk into a pub, two pints, mate, and someone say, who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah. J just... Always, yeah. and like I say, it, it, it is people do judge you. You see, uh, and people are quite often shocked. I think that's why I've done so well when I've worked with people because mm. people have looked and think, "Fucking hell, big dog syndrome." I call it. Yeah, they look at you, big dog. You start talking to them, and they sort of relax. And it's not what you expect, is it? No, but one one thing I've come across a number of times over the years is uh, little man syndrome, Napoleon complex. Yeah. Because people, you know, especially if you if if you come across someone who's younger than you, who's in shit state, you know, fat bastard, doesn't look after themselves, and they look at you, and there's they're fucking jealous, and so you know they'll they'll give you a hard time. Yeah. You know they'll give you a hard time over it. How how would you deal with that? How, how have you dealt with conflict in your life? Well, I hate conflict and I'll walk away from it. You know, I'll just, uh, you know. Thinking man's for scrapper. I'll just, uh, there's been times when I've said things, you know, if somebody's, re if somebody's really gotten in my face and, you know, I'll tell them to fuck off or just leave me alone, yep. you know. But. So, so the, what, what you're telling me, right, so you're travelling around the world, uh, different environments and that, how difficult is that? Because obviously, if, if you're going to a shit, it, it's like, it's not like a normal job. No, it isn't, no. You know, where you you get to know your workforce. Like, you know, prison officer, when you first go in, it's not only the people you work with, you've got to learn all the clients, mm -hmm. yeah? But you, there comes a point when you're comfortable in that environment because there's always people you know. Your environment's constantly changing. Well, that suits me, you see, because it means, 
you know, I set my jobs up and um, generally when I go on a job, I'm left to get on with it. Um, so it suits me. So know. insular, you're not... Yeah, I'm, I'm kind like, of left... It's not like a social environment. And so I'm left to it and I'm not a part of... Especially now that I'm not w working offshore... When I was when I was working on offshore crews and do you know doing four on four off or six on six off or whatever, and I was part of the project crew. That was different. But now that I'm back to doing support and installation work, I'm left to my own devices. So I'm I'm away from that hierarchy, and it fits me. So and it allows me to be. I'm very you know I think I'm pretty good at my job. I've got thirty years experience, and it and it suits and so it suits me. You know I think that type of job suits me you know I'm, and I'm used to the uh, the travel I know a lot of people couldn't put up with all that bullshit but it's uh, because most people only travel when they go on holiday yeah of course you <clears throat> but uh, it suits me it put me off yeah it's, and, 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 and it was and it's been I mean this year has been shit going to the airports Manchester airport you know post pandemic nightmare queues for security and all that shit you know but um, how, how have you balanced how you balance this with home life? Because you've got a lovely lady, you've been married a good while. 18 years, yeah. Yeah, so how how do you think that has affected your missus or do you think she's not seen that? Well, I mean, I'm very lucky. She's a lovely woman and she's, um, but she's also very independent herself. So, you know, she... <clears throat> She puts up with my shit, which is very, you know, I'm very thankful for. Yep. But she does understand it. She does have an understanding of it, you know, and I do. I've, you know, I've been trying to talk more to her about it, you know, because she did say to me recently, she said, if you don't tell me, I don't know. Is this very recent? Yeah. You know, if you don't tell me, I don't know. So, um, but um, as I said, she pushed me into the counselling. And, when did you go uh, for counselling? Well, if we fast forward to 20, um, when was it, 2017. So it's very recent, that. Yeah. So yeah. you're early 50s. Yeah, yeah. And you're just considering counselling. Yeah, so things I'm just... things affected I'm, you I'm, when I'm, you were... Yeah, I'm just thinking about finally uh, putting my hand up, you know, and admitting there's a problem. Uh, went to the GP and I was referred to uh, an organisation called Combat Stress, who are a charitable organisation who do great work um, offering mental health support uh, to to uh, veterans. Um, <clears throat> I got as far as going for an assessment up in Scotland at the centre, and they said, "Yeah, we'll, we recommend one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy counselling." So I went. To, I went for my first appointment down in Shropshire. It was really good. It was really useful. The guy I spoke to was spot on, understanding. How, can I ask you how you felt building up to that? You kept all this inside you. You, 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 yeah. you've been. Did you consider that you were pushed to get something done? No, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll be absolutely honest. I was absolutely shitting myself about okay. going, about going for the assessment and yeah. about going for this um, consultation. What were you worried about? Well, I'd, I'd just never spoken about it, and, and, and I didn't know how to speak about it, you know. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't, how to elocute it, you know, how to put it into, to explain it. And um, so I had this one consultation, and the guy was fantastic. I wish I remembered his name, because he was, he was very good. And we arranged, the arrangement was going to be once every four to six weeks, we'll have an appointment. <clears throat> he said, I'll be in touch soon. Anyway... I got a letter from Combat Stress a few weeks later saying, unfortunately, the NHS has removed our funding, so we can't offer you any more help. And that was the end of that. So I finally tried to get some help, and the uh, rug was pulled from under me, if you so to speak. So um, after that, I mean, I would, uh, things went down for me. I was self-harming. I was you know suicidal was thoughts. that first time you self-harmed in your life uh yeah 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 i've never done it before like so is I, this 217 yeah sit right P people are not going to understand that your early 50s um yeah. do you mind me mentioning the scarring 
No, no, no. So, Nick's got some scarring on his lower arms. Uh, did your missus see this? Or did you try and hide it? No, she was aware of it. She was aware of the... Because um, I came in the house a couple of times covered in blood. Was so. it frustration? Um, I'd never understood it. I, I was, you know, like a lot of blokes, I used to think that it, people who did that, what the fuck are they doing that for? But then the first time I did it, it gave me such a sense of release that I can't explain it. It just no. gave me this fucking sense of they've release. Got, they've got it. And I felt better for it. And, 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 and from then, I almost felt like I'd, I could get myself back on my feet again from doing that. That was like the bottom point that I'd reached. You know, when I got to that point, yeah. and then I'd get myself back up again pretty quickly, you know. But it was just that I'd reached a point and I'd, where I didn't know what to do. So I'd do, I'd do that, you know, so. Can't explain it. No, I, I was going to ask yeah. you, there, there is yeah. no explanation, is there? Did no, you just, no, just, it was just did you do it away from the family home? No, uh, I'd uh, go and hide in the garage. Really? But I used to hide it from my daughter. I made sure, because I, I used to get this, uh, I used to get, you know, strips of tubi grip. Yeah. Put them over my arms. So she You're on a gym, it. you've always been to the gym, haven't you? Yeah. So how's that go when you've got... I used to put tubi grip on my arms. I'm good at gym like that? Yeah, so people can see it. Okay. So if anyone asks, oh, I've just got a bit of it. I'm just keeping my arms warm or just, you know, bit yeah. muscles under a bit. So. We embarrassed about it. Um, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you, you you know, you think, what the fuck am I doing this for? What, what's driven me to do this, you know? And, uh, you know, again, it's just uh, because you, you, because you don't know what to do, you develop piss poor coping mechanisms. You know, when, when you look back on it, you think, what the fuck did I do that for? But it was just something that happened, that a method at the time of coping, you know, because I didn't know any better, you know, so. But people, I know, I know, I completely know what you're saying. Um, people won't understand that though, will they? No. Because, you know, um, I, I would advise everyone to get fresh air if they can do some exercise, eat the best they can or whatever for mental health. However, you're doing all that, you look after yourself, you keep in shape. And obviously, like you're saying, you're not seeing any way of coping other than that, it just... Well, I'll tell you this about the, 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 the one thing about going to the gym every day. It's, it's, not, it's not a chore, it's cheap therapy. It's one hour of every day when I'm not worrying about other shit. You taught yourself. I stick my headphones on, listen to some heavy metal or punk rock or whatever, and I just lose myself, lose myself in the training, and I don't, I'm not worrying about anything. So it's cheap therapy. Simple as that. I enjoy it as well. Yeah, I enjoy it as well. Yeah, but it it is therapeutic. You know, as you say, exercise is important. You know that not. You know, getting fresh air and. Have you ever sort of? Taking yourself away, uh, you know, maybe come out of the gym or whatever and sat there and it, it sort of gets you, get a bit emotional or anything like that. You know, because you're holding things in or whatever. Oh, I've sat in my car in a complete mess, tears a lot, you know, many times. I, I always find when I go to the gym, you know, if, if you're going to have an outpouring, it, you're exhausted, whatever, you've got your endorphins and everything going, yeah. and it just sort of floods. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've had that, yeah, and I do, uh, I do have, because some people think that you, the way you look, you're not emotional, and that's bollocks, but again, it's something you try and hide. I do have moments where, where I feel, I just feel, um, what the fuck am I gonna do? How am I going to deal with this? And still? I, and, oh yeah, and I still, and I find, you know, I have moments when I'll bawl my eyes out when things go wrong or I feel things are too getting too much, you know? Do you, I, I know they do, but do you, do you think, like, like we just said in there, uh, we mentioned that a lot of people have got a lot going on at the minute. 
you know, a lot of people's like worries now come from financial hardship, don't they? If you've got kids, you're struggling to feed them, put your eating on, you've got no money, that is gonna, it's gonna impact everyone without your own bits as well, because it adds up, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, let me tell you another, uh, going back a few years ago, 2000 and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the oil and gas industry, the offshore industry, anyone offshore will know this, the last serious downturn was around 2015. Okay. And um, massive redundancies everywhere. Why is that? Well, it's it's generally related to the price of oil. So okay. when, the pro when the price of oil drops. Did it drop right down then? It, it, it went from a high, it was like over $100 a barrel, and it just dropped right down. And it stayed down. And so uh, what, ha what happened was, you know, multiple billion dollar projects were canceled. Um, Thousands of people laid off, no work for contractors. And this went on for quite a while, you know, about 18 months. And I didn't do a day's work. I think it was about seven months. Now, I, I tried signing on, but they, but the, I went to the job center, you know, and yeah. it took them six weeks to make a decision. And they said, oh, you're self-employed. So you don't, can't, you, I couldn't get housing benefit. I couldn't get anything. They agreed to pay me Fourteen pounds a week, uh, job seekers allowance. Because uh, you've never paid any tax or national insurance, have you? I've, I've always paid tax. Yeah, of course you have. That's what I mean. Yeah, and I, and I wasn't self-employed. I work on short-term contracts. Yeah. So I wasn't self-employed. But that's uh, how how was that seven months going from someone who's active who has never dealt with a mental health properly to the periods of downtime for me are worse. If you've well, got nothing was, uh, on there. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, it was chaotic. I got to the point where, I mean, I'd say, I mean, any, anyone knows if they go a month without a salary, it's, but try going seven months without any money coming in. Okay, now, I mean, I was down to nothing. I had nothing in the bank. I was down to the food in the fridge. I wasn't getting any benefits. My wife was working um, two days a week, uh, minimum wage. So we were just, <clears throat> obviously I was paying the mortgage and all the, all, all the utility bills and shit. So she was kind of buying the food. But then I, when I reached the point of having no money, um, I was literally a week away from being completely fucked. This, <clears throat> this is when, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, charities here, just to, uh, Military charities. Because uh, well, I've this already was, told you what I think this, about. Th this is where this, uh, and I thought, right, I'm a veteran. Sure, I can get some help with this. Phoned the Royal British Legion. Explained the situation. Well, what do you want from us? I said, uh, maybe you could help me out. Pay me ut, you know, just pay, pay me utility bills or something. Oh no, we don't do anything like that. Call the other well-known charity is uh, SAFA Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen's Families Association. So the RBL fobbed me off onto them. I phoned Saffa and they said, oh no, we don't do anything like that. Try your regimental association. So I tried my regimental association and they, didn't, they, they weren't fucking interested either. So, um, so that was my initial, <laughs> my initial involvement with, uh, with these uh, organizations. I'm not sure I'd call them charities. Right, listen, they're organizations. you know I've got a fucking beef. Is there something like three and a half thousand? Was I far wrong? military charities. But right, my figures might be wrong. I, I looked into this and it deeply pissed me off because, you know, we had people at work selling their health heroes, uh, bands mm. and things like this. You know, I bought t-shirts and stuff like that. There is fucking thousands of military charities in there. The homeless squaddies, I don't know how many there is. Uh, a few years ago, it was around about 7,000. It might be more. I don't know whether they'd even know an accurate figure. But the point is that if every charity out there adopted two squaddies who were on the street, ex-squaddies, there'd be nobody on the street, would they? Mm. These charities, like a lot of other charities, civilian charities and that, these fucking people getting paid £100,000 a year as a fucking chairman who turns up once a week yeah, as fucking yeah. tea and custard creams and does fuck all. They're a rip-off, aren't they? My, my, one of the, my things, if I was able to do it, I would like to do would be to start a charity where 
absolutely every single penny went to who it was intended for. I mean, when when you're talking about these the well-known charities, I'm not saying they don't do some good work. I mean, if you look at the British Leaders website, for example, they've got a they've got six care homes, which you have to pay to stay in, by the way. They're not free. They're building this village in Kent, I think they call it the Centenary Village, which is aimed at veterans with but dementia. Do not, but do you not almost think they are businesses, they're not charities? Yes, yeah, it is a business, and, and this is, it's like their benchmark project at the moment. But in terms of, and it will benefit a small number of people, but that's the problem. It'll benefit a small number of people. And yet the British Legion has assets of hundreds of millions of pounds. And my problem with military charities is that they're missing the target audience. People need, people need mental health support and they need help getting them back on their feet. Spending millions building fucking villages and... I mean, the British Legion shut all its respite centres a few years ago to save money. There was one in my town where people could get away, you know, for, a, you know, a time away just for respite to, you know, get their head together. And they shut them all to save money. And if you trawl through the websites, even on the SAFA website, where it talks about, you know, they talk about offering um, well-being and psychological help. But if you, if you go through the links, it links you back to the NHS. They're not offering anything. Only combat stress. They're the only one that I came across that did actually offer. I mean, Help for Heroes, you know, did, they've done a lot of good stuff um, for wounded guys. You I'm, know, I'm guys not saying they lot. don't do some good stuff. What I'm you saying know. is that a lot of these organisations support or employ people on oh, yeah, yeah. The charity, ridiculous the charities, salary. Yeah, 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 they're not, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a, a bit of a scandal last year because the Royal British Legion spent a hundred thousand pounds on a new logo rebranding i did see it. that on youtube yeah hundred grand yeah i did see that and if you look at the logo the fucking five-year-old could have done yeah. it for free yeah but, but but there you go that's uh you're right they're, they're not charities they're organizations they're they're businesses and um we've now got a minister for veterans affairs a fellow called johnny mercer he was sacked by trust, but reinstated by Sunak. And he's a, he's a former officer, did three tours of Afghanistan, full respect to him. But it's just window dressing by the government. Because there's no, we don't have, have, like the Yanks, we don't have a veterans agency or veterans hospitals. So um, what we're missing is that level of support, that that immediate level of support for, for all the people out there that are falling through the cracks constantly, you know, that have that have issues that, that can't settle, that, that are, you know, there isn't, there's nothing, you know, there's, that they're, they're missing the point, you know, and there, there, are, there are some very small, there's a, there's a, there's a charity called Vet, Veterans United Against Suicide, which I think is run by a Falklands vet, um, Royal Marine. And they've taken on the grim task of counting the number of veteran suicides. Every really? Year. Because you know our good old Ministry, Ministry of Defence didn't even do that. And they don't want that in the public domain. Well, well why would they? Because they don't want people to know. Do you, do you think the military should... Right. I won't get into it in prisons, but with prisoners, there is uh, what they call the resettlement programme. Um, I'll not talk about it. You know, but it's there. Do you do you think that the, the the military should have some sort of resettlement program, whatever that? You know, to to sort of help people adjust to civil life. It's it's almost like, um, well, just getting back in sight. It's not a normal thing, is it? Going to war is not a normal thing. Did did you ever think that you would be going to war, or was that not a consideration? Till, uh, probably not a consideration until it happened because it was uh, the Cold War. It was the middle of the, apart from Northern Ireland, there was nothing else, you know, at the time. 
So it was never really something that <clears throat> I think a lot of people from that era, yeah, you know, joined a peacetime army. That's what they expected, you know, didn't expect to do it. So, and uh, no amount of training can prepare you for the for what you see, for the carnage and chaos of um, of what happens, and uh, you know, the effects of munitions and and the like, which is. Uh, Utterly terrifying, and and of course it's really all the civilian population who suffer. The people there—that's yeah, what I was going to ask you. Obviously, the civilian population who suffer. You're in somebody else's country. Uh, how much does the suffering of other people affect you? Well, I think it. Um, <clears throat> I can remember when I was in the Gulf. Sitting, I can remember one day sitting there thinking to myself, "What the fuck is this to do with me?" But you know, I was I was in the army. That's what I get. You know, I'd signed up for it, so I just got on with what they told me to do. But um, it does stay with you. And then when you see future, you know, like Iraq, Afghanistan, and you see, especially Iraq. I mean, the hunt. You know, I mean, I don't know how many civilians were killed in that war, and of course, our own servicemen. There's a lot of controversy women. around these wars, isn't there? You know, well, well yeah, you know, I mean... Uh, what, the, the politics, how, how what, does that affect you as a soldier when you're in the job? Well, I think, I mean, what it, what it boils down to is that when you're in that situation, you... I didn't realise it at the time, but um, <clears throat> in the military, you are simply the blunt end of the foreign policy of whichever bunch of idiots is in power at the time. You're at the sharp end of, of their decisions. Yep. It's nothing to do with queen and country, king and country, any of that. Yep. In fact, the only thing you care about is you and your mates getting back in one piece. Yep. It's so, uh, you know, that's something you've got to, you've got to take into consideration. Did you ever you question what you were doing? Uh, yeah, 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 w was, absolutely. Was that was that a topic of conversation with your mates? Yeah. At yeah, the time, you know, yeah. do, do you see what the media's telling us and that sort of thing, you know, or do you try and isolate yourself and get on with the job in hand, as it were? Well, yeah, I mean, you get on with it. You get on with it, but, uh, you know, I'm sure we did, um, you know, I remember talking about it, yeah, you know, what's this to do with us? Are we simply safeguarding America's supply of oil? You know, what's that to do with us? And I feel I feel terrible for the um, you know the Afghan vets. I mean, and I know I, I know they did some sterling work over there, some great projects for the communities and what have you. But ultimately, the Americans pulled out, and it was almost like another Vietnam. The Afghan National Army that they'd spent billions on training just folded, and the Taliban took straight over. So what those boys must think about? Um, Especially people who did, <coughs> Excuse me. who did multiple tours, what they must think about, you know, why they that, were that's, that's, That on its own uh, has got impact mental health. It's got to, of course it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you've got this. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who who need the services. As I found out, like I said, I went to uh, you know the counselling that I had. And I was told to <clears throat> go and see my GP and um, the private counselling that my wife paid for after the combat stress thing had uh, fallen through. And uh, the counsellor, she was very good. She advised me to, to go and get a clinical assessment from the NHS. So I did that, saw my GP. And she said to me at the time, she said, I'll warn you. She said, maybe two years, four years. Yeah, I know. Four years I waited for that. And what was that assessment for? Well, it was for, you know, psychological, a psychiatric assessment, basically. Um, which brought up other things as well, of course. But, um, but of course, in those four years, I was marking time. Um, up and down, because I couldn't get treatment. I couldn't get medication. Because you can go to a counsellor and a counsellor can say, well, I think you've, you know, this is what you've got and this is what you should. Yep. But 
you've got to see a psychiatrist or a doctor to, to, to get prescribed anything or to get a treatment, you know. Yeah, of course so, you have. so you're left in that uh, in that state of limbo. So it was only late last year that I uh, had my assessment, and I am taking some medication at the moment, which which as it has been helpful. What what way has it been helpful? Um, it's kind of shut out some of the noise and it's um, concentrated me a bit more. I feel I feel more uh, less distracted at times, you know, so so that's a positive thing. It's an ongoing thing. Um, I contacted Combat Stress this week, sent them an email and they said someone's going to contact me. So I'll see if, um, you know, there's anything further developed from that. But it's uh, you know it's a constant uh, it's a constant thing that never goes away you know there's, you know it's uh, there's no I don't think there's a cure for it people some people say there is but uh, the other issues that I brought up I don't know if you want me to mention them all all everything you know yeah it'll, well, help, it'll help people understand well when I went through the counselling um, the counsellor said. Well, you've clearly got PTSD, the panic attacks and the like, probably from your military service. She said, but you've, she said, you do realise you've probably got an underlying problem as well. I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, uh, and she started talking about the spectrum, you know, autism, ADHD, Asperger's, Tourette's, OCD. She said, I'd put you somewhere on the ADHD spectrum. And I just left her. I said, you know, but um, what it did do, obviously I was then waiting four years for the uh, clinical assessment, was it made me read up on it, educate myself. And I realized it also made me take a, lo a long, hard look in the mirror and admit to myself, you know, fuck yeah, that is how I've been. You know, I am like that. I, you know, I do have, you know, I don't have all the, the problems of it, I mean, the one thing I don't have is procrastination because I I used to call it my, my 100 mile per hour mind. Yep. So I'm very focused on, once I, I can I can get lost in something, which... Do you not think that's the PTSD? Well, I, I think the one maybe affects the other because um, they're all up there, aren't they? You well, know, one, on the, well, the thing we're not discussed, how do you sleep? Uh, I'm actually s sleeping a lot better now. I, I was having um, terrible recurring nightmares for a long time, but that's gone away now. That's, that's one thing I'm grateful for, and I am generally sleeping okay. So that's, uh, that's something I'm grateful for. Uh, uh, I occasion, uh, and before I, was, before I took the medication, which is for ADHD, I used to I used to not sleep because I'd get something in my mind and I'd lie there with this thing just spinning through my mind all night. And I'd get no and I'd literally all night I'd be just sitting there thinking about it, lying there, sitting there. Not thinking. not necessarily anything bad. No, not no all sorts of things. Just anything. It could be anything in it, but it'd just spin around me. Right, head. I, 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 you I know. still have trouble with that sometimes now yeah. and it is silly things, isn't it? Oh yeah, it could be anything. It could be anything ridiculous. But it just spin and it around. repeats it. Yeah, constantly. Round and round and round yeah. and round and round and round. Yeah. yeah. And so that was um, that's kind of gone away now with the medication, and and so I'm I'm grateful for that. Uh, the panic attacks, um, the pandemic hit me quite hard because in in my industry, um, every different vessel owner or rig owner had their own protocol for dealing with the pandemic and every country was different and but what they were doing was they were generally sticking us in hotel rooms in quarantines for a week to two weeks at a time you know you couldn't leave your hotel room before you worked yeah you'd have to have uh, covid tests several covid tests and uh that was when i i, I struggled with that that was my last panic attack and it's been over 18 months now. And that, so that was... Have, 
panic attacks been consistent since your last six months in the military then? Yeah. The, the, there were periods when it had kind of disappeared for a while. Yeah. But then it, it, it would always come back. Do you think you sleep? You see, for me, when I get really tired, really tired, I know it's coming, I know when I'm super tired and you can't control it, it doesn't make you a bad person or anything, does it? I don't have to be going through any stress. It, it just, when I'm fatigued, panic attack. I haven't had one for a good, but it's it's like teetering now, you know what I mean? Because I've had a couple of rough weeks sleep. But how, how have you dealt with them, with work? You know, have you ever been on a job and you've had a panic attack or whatever? Because yes. it's not something you can hide, is it? What do you do, take yourself off the toilet or? Um, well, it, 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 it did happen. It's happened two or three times on a job. And of course that impacts you. Um, and another thing, like the military, the offshore industry is um, mental health, you don't talk about it. Because if, if people know about it or you're finished, you know, you won't get work, simple. There's no, uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Here's, this is, this is many years ago. I was, I was on, on and off antidepressants for 20 years. You know, I'm, I'm only talking, you know, the SRRI type yeah. antidepressants, you know. You're supposed to declare your medication whenever you go on a ship. Really? And, um, yeah, to the medic. Is that not, um, like showing prejudice or something? Well, Do you know what I mean? It's a bit. You, but, uh, what, the way they justify it is if if you have a med medical emergency and you've not declared your medication, okay. they, they don't know what's wrong with you. Okay. Anyway, I was on working on this one ship. I won't yeah. say the name of it. And uh, the medic, I've been on. I've done a few trips on this ship. Yeah. And the medic, and I spoke to her, got on with her. She seemed a nice girl. She was an ex nurse in the National Health Service. Okay. And I hadn't been declaring medication. I thought. Oh, I'll declare it this time. Yeah. And I went in, popped them down. I think I was taking Cytalopram or something like that. Right. And her reaction stunned me. She just she just looked at me. She said, "What?" She said, "What the fuck are those?" I said, "Well, you know what they are." She said, "Yeah, but what are you doing here if you're taking those?" I said, "Well, what do you mean?" I said, "I'm prescribing." Over the them. counter. Prescription drug that I said I'm pre prescribed thousands and thousands of people are on in this country. Yeah, I said I'm pres prescribed them by my GP, and she said, "Does your employer know you're taking these?" And I just picked them up and walked off. And that was a, I mean, that was a someone who'd worked in the NHS. If he, if, if if there was one person you thought would have empathy and understanding, it would be that person. Well, right? I think the private sector is quite brutal, me, and I think. Uh, a lot of people sell their souls to, you know, if, if you had ethics and integrity or whatever, and empathy, you know, even if you're in the private sector, you'd understand, wouldn't you? Maybe. How, how many years constantly were you on them for? Um, I've probably taken every different type over 20 years, but I didn't need them. I wasn't, you know. Well, this is, what, I what I was going to ask you, you know, if your symptoms remain... All right, prison service again. I don't want to talk about prison service, really, but one of the lads, as I left, uh, he was on top dose. Had a bit of a breakdown. We had a chat in my last week, and he'd, he'd been on for a couple of years, and I, I, ju I just said to him, I weren't, weren't being asked. He just said, right, he'd been on two years. Your stress is from this job. If you stay in this job, it's not going to go away, and the medication is not going to do anything. For me, it was situational. You know what I mean? Yeah. The job was bringing him stress and anxiety. He was taking medication for that, but it weren't going to go away. It might alleviate the symptoms a little bit. Yeah. However, CP possibly would not believe, again, looking at you, physically active, gym every day and all that, that you'd be taking antidepressants because you've said you've got good lifestyle as far as drinking now, what you eat, Exercise, they're the best things, aren't they? Yeah. A bit of fresh air. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I still have the worries of uh, people around me 
getting the wrong opinion, getting the wrong impression for whatever reason. But um, that's life, unfortunately. You know, human beings are, are judgmental fuckers, unfortunately. And uh, so, like a lot of people, I try and put on a mask. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the coping mechanisms, it sounds stupid, I used to have this handwritten list in my wallet yep. about how to behave. Who gave you that? I wrote it. Oh, you wrote it? I wrote it down. You know, and before I went anywhere on a job or something, I'd read read this like a mantra. You know, smile, talk to people, all this bullshit. And I'd sit there, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, you know, and um, <laughs> in an effort to fit in. So although people had looked on the outside like, like myself, I'm looking right, you, you've always worked mm. or whatever, it's not been easy, has it? Oh no, 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 no. It's been uh, it's been a tough old ride. So you you sort of up until recently, when you've had a bit of counselling or whatever, and sought help, you sort of tried to manage your um, stress, anxiety, PTSD, in order to appear normal. Oh yeah, yeah. Try just try and fit in. Just try not to uh, give people an inkling because because it's still. Uh, mental health is still the last taboo and um, unless people have had issues themselves or they've got you know kids who've got issues they're very they're very ignorant of them of, of, of uh, what it's like to have them we're very dismissive aren't we yes and intolerant yes completely which goes back to the never judge a book people do yeah. constantly but it would be nice if, um, I mean, it, it is it is um, society wide, especially at the moment with with what's going on, the craziness that's going on. Yep. Everyone's worried about, you know, with heated bills going through the roof and mortgages, and you know, everybody's worried, and it's going to increase the the strain on uh, NHS services. This is the problem. With, I mean, England, there's, there's what 60 million people now in England. Yeah. So the NHS is just overrun. So getting any help, well, is it's it difficult? The, you know, realistically, the NHS is a, is a big issue for people, isn't it? But the NHS, for me, it needs a good business manager, and I mean a good business manager, and you need to get rid of all this middle management who are well paid. Hmm. You know. They say it's underfunded. The funding's there. It's mismanaged. It's not run as a good business. You wouldn't run a business how the NHS is built. But for me, they're building more prisons. They could empty half the prison population out now, build and put funds into mental health. You know, there isn't, you know, four years now. I knew you were going to say around about four years for a diagnosis, unless you've got the money to go private for ADHD or whatever, um, autism, all these things. That's increasing, isn't it? It seems to me like there's more and more children who are getting diagnosed with autism or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I looked, I looked at getting a, a private assessment, but it was, it was something like a thousand pounds to get a, an assessment, you know. With, with no guarantee it's gonna yeah yeah so uh, you know and, and, and not everyone can afford that not you know it's um it's out of the reach of, uh, of most people to do that so um so what do you do you know should we leave the first part there for now we seem to have come to a bit of a a natural conclusion to that. Yeah. Is there anything specifically we haven't covered that you would like to talk about in order to help people? Well, one thing that's, um, that is popping up at the moment is uh, veterans-led veterans hubs, in, you know, locally. So like veterans um, breakfast clubs and things like this, which uh, which are a good idea. I haven't attended any any yet. Maybe I will. This is what you consider. <clears throat> and um, there's a lot of that from uh, uh, in different localities. What you know. sort of formats that? Did well, you... they have like they have like uh, like a breakfast club. They'll meet once every fortnight or something in a cafe and just just somewhere for 
for them to, to meet in a safe place with like-minded people, you know. Do you think um, you might not have carried all this, this with you if you'd have been able to sit down with someone at an early stage when leaving the military who had experience of this? Do, yeah, do, you yeah, think veterans, do you think veterans have got something to offer to the current military or whatever, you know, a support network, and maybe they don't realise that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, I think that's the problem ultimately is that we don't have any national... Um, service that's purely veteran based you know that and anything any charity or organization that exists is so oversubscribed it's um, you know it's very difficult even the likes of combat stress to get uh, to get onto the programs you know if you were to meet up with some of your ex buddies now do you think you'd be able to talk about the things we've been talking about or not? Or do you think that would be difficult? Um, I mean, I've met up because I went to the two funerals. As I said earlier, two, yeah. of me, two of my buddies died this year suddenly. And so I met up with a load of my ex-army mates for the first time in 30 years. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was, even though the uh, it was under awful circumstances, it was actually quite cathartic to meet them. And it was just typical squaddy banter taking the piss out of each other you know which is helpful but would would i talk about the other stuff probably not i think everybody but it's good to be just around you people who who understand you you know yeah. you know you, you know so you don't necessarily have to talk about so if that. you know you know that sort of thing you know that's yeah that's it you know that's it that's it, and uh, and that's that's useful. That's what that's the mistake I've ma I've made by isolating myself from people. You know, I've just tried to hide it away as I've gotten older because I've just got sick of it. I'm gonna, I've got sick of people being judgmental, and uh, <clears throat> so I've tried to hide. Maybe it. You've carried this a lot of years. Yeah. You know, I know you are three years younger than me, but you're not. Yeah, young man. You're still a young man, but you have carried this for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 30 years? Too long. 30 odd years? Yeah. You know, and it affects your whole life. It affects everything. Relationships, work, everything. It's your entire, your entire life. You know that. You, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know that yourself. Definitely. So. Should we leave it there for now then? Yeah, yeah. How did you find that? Yeah, it was good, mate. That's, um, that was good. Listen, was, guys. That was a nice talk. If you've got any questions for Nick, uh, we are going to do some more work together. I'm going to start a little segment. I used to do Mental Health Mondays, speaking to people about mental health specific lads and lasses, people with disabilities and the like. Um, yeah, any questions? Any ex? There's a lot of ex-military that do follow me. Uh, bless them. You know, get the questions in. If he's comfortable answering them, we'll we'll have a bit of a question and answer. But definitely not done. We are definitely going to meet up again. I'm going to have some more chats. Thanks for coming. Can I ask you one question? Yes, you can. I was thinking of a, a meaningful question to ask because I've been watching your channel so often. Do you believe that we are living in a morally corrupt time? Or do you think it's always been like that? But because of these things, it's in our faces and I it's think, more transparent. I think we live in a, a morally corrupt time. Mm. I think... Uh, I, I am not... Right, conspiracy th theorists, you've asked me this now, so I'll just... Conspiracy theory, yeah, started by the CIA or whatever to dismiss people who had alternative beliefs or whatever. I do believe now we are morally corrupt. I think there's a lot of things going on. I think social media is putting these things out there which is affecting people. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just one little beef me as someone who's paid taxes all my life and that, someone just giving money in a position to just give money away and say, yeah, we're gonna give you this or whatever. That is not your money to do with as you please. Uh, I think, I fear for kids. 
I don't think schools are what they used to be. I don't think the level of education is what it used to be. I don't think we're preparing them. I think social media is ruining kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, image and everything else. And, you know, uh, they're, they're not prepared for the work. Their expectation is here and the reality is here. Hmm. I do think it's morally corrupt. And you can only do your bit within your own environment. That's true. Yeah. That, that's what I think, to be honest. I could talk about that all day, and maybe we'll come back and talk about some of them things. Because yeah. it does affect you. Nick. I could tell uh, at the start of that, mate, that, uh, you know, uh, some of that was quite hard, but uh, thank you for your time. We are going to hook up again. Like I said, if you've got any questions for the man, get them in and let's do it. Thanks for coming, I'll see you there.